and the title is uh, quite general. Uh, the, uh, the topic is uh, what we have seen so far, so the assessment of existing buildings using pushover analysis. Uh, and existing measuring buildings are those that better uh, suit this uh, this approach of uh, linear analysis uh, applied to the assessment of their capacity because they are intrinsically nonlinear. Their behavior is nonlinear since the beginning, since the early uh, deformations. And we have stressed uh, also in this uh, last presentation of uh, Romina, but in the previous as well. Uh, I can remember those of uh, Rita Bento, of uh, Alexandre Costa, Alessandro Marasca, and, and the others. This issue of this local uh, mechanism that can be uh, prevented uh, using suitable uh, devices that uh, connect uh, perpendicular walls and walls to floors to, um, to contrast this mechanism. And, uh, uh, and allow the activation of a global response, a global behavior which is governed by the world in plane response, and then uh, which is also uh, ruled by this in plane stiffness of the diaphragms. I will start with this uh, let's say video in which you can see two stages of one recent test that we have performed in, uh, in, uh, in Pavia on this. Uh, so reduced scale to um, building aggregate, measure building aggregate is representative. It was meant to be representative of a of a situation typical of a historic center in uh, in Switzerland, in the city of Basel. And you can see uh, you from the uh, video on the on your uh, left that the local mechanism was actually activated from in this part with the say starting of uh, overturning of this part. But then once we had activated all two diaphragm connections and these tie rods, then we could move on and continue to a much higher level of uh, acceleration, preventing this mechanism and then activating, uh, say, I would say activating a lot, the in-plane damage and the in-plane response and then the in-plane damage of the world parallel to the shaking direction. Uh, this was a stone uh, measuring building. Uh, the use of pushover analysis uh, is, uh, you know, pushover is a uh, nonlinear static analysis which uh, allows uh, carrying uh, uh, static analysis. Uh, so we accept that uh, in the calculation of the, the displacement demand, we will use some simplified uh, um, formula. Uh, but we can uh, identify the evolution of uh, strength with the lateral deformation, and we can identify potential uh, uh, mechanisms and uh, fragile uh, elements. Uh, we can say predict the, the, the localization of deformation demand in specific elements, and we can then uh, you can then uh, try uh, to. Um, say target our interventions to improve uh, all these uh, characteristics so we can uh, we need some tools to do this uh, kind of uh, analysis and we can apply this uh, analysis uh, both to global uh, the global response of buildings or to the, the response of specific walls if the stiffness of floors uh, is not allowing uh, uh, global box type behavior. The idea is that we apply a system of horizontal forces to, uh, to a structure which can be also transformed into an equivalent single degree of freedom system. We use this uh, a bilinear approximation typically, which is then uh, the basis for uh, uh, computing not only the capacity but also the uh, demand uh, in the sense that we can use the bilinear uh, formula and, uh, parameters to um, to compute the displacement demand. In this case, you see the, what is reported in Eurocode 8, uh, which is the uh, famous formula by Professor Pfeiffer. And what, also, what is also relevant is that uh, pushover analysis provides uh, 
I would say the evolution of, of capacity with, um, with increased lateral displacement, but also the, it allows to, to check the spread of damage and the peak of damage uh, for increasing displacement. In this sense, it is uh, widely recognized that the displacement, the lateral displacement in particular, is a good uh, measure of uh, damage, is a good proxy of, um, of damage. So we can uh, easily uh, use this global displacement as a measure of um, the, the damage levels for different limit states. And in particular, you can see in this case, you can identify these points uh, on the capacity curve, uh, identifying the um, different limit states, uh, which can be operational, uh, slight, uh, moderate, uh, or severe or near collapse limit states, depending on the codes and depending on definitions that the code provide with this, for, this, uh, um, for these damage states. Uh, I was saying before that uh, we need a tool, a computational model uh, for running a pushover analysis of measure structures. Uh, there are many characteristics that you can see are listed here. Um, that this uh, tool should uh, um, fulfill, and so they, they they have to comply with all the failure modes and of all structural members that are included in in the model can be which can be included in the model, and these uh, um, failure modes uh, are associated with strength criteria that are uh, depending on the different codes. So this, uh, from this point, but also not, but not only for, for, from this point, the tools need to be, um, to be flexible enough itself. So to, to accommodate for different code regulations and code uh, settings that can be different. Uh, it, it has to satisfy local and global equilibrium. Uh, it, it looks uh, an obvious statement, this one, but uh, I can guarantee it is not. In, I'm not talking about Remuri, obviously, but there are uh, other codes or other approaches which are not respecting equilibrium. Um, uh, it has to, to provide a reasonable compromise between accuracy, uh, simplicity of use, and the capability of interpreting interpretation of the of the result. Uh, it also allows to identify the damage thresholds uh, starting from the damage you observe in the different members and then you can report as a global condition for for the for the model. This is a, a picture I prepared a number of years ago. I always like it because uh, it is uh, somehow clarifying what is uh, a pushover analysis or a pullover analysis. Uh, because uh, it is a system of forces that are applied to uh, you know, a system of, in general, uh, generally speaking, horizontal forces that are applied to, um, to a structure, to the nodes of a, of a structure, and they are increased until uh, the, the the lateral, the lateral capacity increases when we increase the lateral displacement. But then, the, uh, when this uh, car is uh, continuing to, to move, the, to, to increase the, the, the lateral displacement, uh, it, it can occur. It, you, it uh, uh, normally occurs that uh, at a certain point, the, cap the, the strength capacity uh, is reached, and then if we increase the displacement, the lateral strength decreases. And it is very important that you also follow that uh, softening branch of the curve. So that we follow the curve, the evolution of the lateral uh, capacity once the, um, the, the lateral strength is, uh, is no more increasing, but can increase with the increase, the increase in displacement. It is uh, helpful to, um, to identify properly uh, limit states, but it also uh, important. It is also important to uh, consider an important part of the structural capacity before collapse. Uh, 
in terms of results of a pushover analysis, we have the evolution of the base shear, which is the sum of the of all these forces that are applied. Uh, and it is expressed in, as a function of uh, one displacement, which can be a real displacement, typically uh, the displacement of, of one node at the, uh, at the top story, or can be a virtual displacement, which can be, for instance, a combination of displacement at the um, at the given uh, story, it can be the, usually the top one, uh, in case of a very flexible diaphragm, screen, for instance. Starting from these uh, analysis, we get the capacity curve, and then the capacity curve can be transformed. And it, after this transformation, which uh, in the end mm, results in the capacity curve in a special uh, um, diagram with spectral acceleration, spect spectral displacement, the curve can be approximated by a uh, bilinear uh, curve, which is helpful to. Uh, com compute the displacement demand. The different code provide different solutions for for this uh, last step, and we will see that in some cases they are very uh, different and can provide different uh, uh, results. And uh, the result that Alessandro Malasca was showing about the, the Netherlands uh, are uh, actually related to one of these uh, cases in which the uh, this the, the original version of this Dutch code uh, refer to a very conservative prediction of uh, of displacement demand. The equivalent frame uh, approach is something that we have developed uh, following uh, first of all observation, and if you watch at the damage after the main uh, earthquakes in um, in areas where we have uh, mesory buildings, uh, the last relevant one is the one in Croatia, uh, we can notice that damage is typically concentrated in specific elements. In particular, you can see this damage concentration in piers, in some cases, in spandrels, or a mix of damage in piers and spandrels. But these elements are those where typically where we have a, a damage concentration. And this allows to uh, idealize uh, the lateral in-plane behavior of a, of a wall with openings as the one of an equivalent frame structure, a structure with vertical elements which are coinciding with the piers, horizontal elements which are typically spandrel uh, beams or other beams that can be present, for instance, concrete beams, or concrete beams representing um, the um, out of plane stiffness of floors. So we we have these uh, mechanisms uh, which are uh, somehow um, reported in some codes, for instance, some codes in the, in the US, which uh, divide this uh, behavior in, uh, in this soft story mechanism or peer mechanism and these. Uh, spandrel mechanism, we know that re in reality, and in particular in the case of irregular buildings, we typically have a mix of damage, which of course, both in uh, piers and in spandrels. And this is also the, this is the result of observation, but this is also the result of uh, experimental and numerical evidence, as you can see from the uh, figures on, on the right. The identification of uh, an equivalent frame model uh, uh, from the geometry of a facade can be a, let's say, almost automatic and uh, trivial uh, operation, or can be uh, an operation that which needs uh, the specification of uh, clear steps. Uh, in particular, you can see from this uh, uh, plot uh, what is the, um, let's say, the rationals followed in. In Tremuri, for this uh, identification, you first uh, identify spandrels, uh, then piers, uh, and then the remaining parts are assumed to be the rigid nodes, the rigid portion of measure which are connected with the nodes of the frame, which is the uh, which is represented in the figure on on the right here. 
you can see here. And this is uh, somehow simple, very simple in the case of uh, regularly distributed uh, openings. Uh, even if uh, in, when you are close to the um, the ends of the of the wall, then you uh, may uh, need to use uh, some rules that increase uh, the effective height of these of these piers. And this also can be depending on dependent on the on the type of uh, lintels you have in uh, above your 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 windows or your wall or your doors because if you have um, uh, lintels that are very well connected and um, deeply um, connected into the um, the piers, you cannot have a crack starting from this point, but then uh, you tend to have a, a, a lateral pill high, um, height, which is the same of the uh, of the neighbor opening. In case of irregularly distributed uh, openings, then you can still uh, manage to identify uh, um, an equivalent frame. Uh, uh, topology. For instance, in this case, you can see uh, that the, we have a, a misaligned uh, window with respect to the um, door at the, um, at the lower story. Uh, the, in this case, it is uh, missing the window, so we have uh, three piers at the, um, in the first story and two uh, piers at the second story. So it is a very say, irregular uh, condition that we can manage to continue analyzing in uh, in an equivalent frame uh, approach with some let's say effort but uh, it is completely automatic now in uh, in Tremuri and you have used many times uh, and in, we have seen uh, the application of these uh, principles also in uh, in the case of many of the presentation that we could uh, um, um, watch um, before uh, all the uh, main failure uh, mechanisms and uh, associated strength criteria need to be implemented in uh, in these models. So we have to um, to consider the potential occurrence of uh, bending, rocking with the toe crashing, uh, diagonal shear, uh, diagonal tension shear mechanisms, uh, and uh, Shear sliding uh, with, with uh, horizontal or step uh, cracks, uh, which can be also ruled by the cracking occurring at the uh, uh, at the two extreme of the of the pier. So uh, the the response, the lateral response of the piers can be uh, very simplified, but in a, in the, in the model, you have to properly uh, introduce all these uh, criteria, which interact with each other. And uh, the common uh, uh, aspect of all these uh, criteria, which is uh, a typical feature of, uh, of measuring elements, but not, not only measuring elements, is that the lateral strength is strongly depending on the applied vertical load. And so we can have a different uh, uh, behavior and different governing uh, um, failure modes and then strength criteria, strength criteria depending on the level of uh, axial force acting in uh, in uh, on the pier. And this is an example of uh, what happens in, uh, for instance, one pier of uh, one building, and the model need to be able to uh, to go. Um, to reproduce this kind of uh, effect. So when we push this uh, wall from uh, left to right, then we have a variation of the axial forces. So we typically have an increase uh, of the forces on this side and the decrease from on, on this side. So when we are in this part of the, um, of the diagram, of the interaction diagram, uh, uh, in between uh, the axial force and shear force, we, we see that we are governed by this uh, uh, line, which uh, 
is associated with, in this case, with the diagonal uh, cracking. And uh, when we, but if you, what, if you look at what happens in the other piece, the situation is different. And if we push the, the, this wall from from right to left, uh, this piece becomes uh, um, appear with the lower uh, axial force and the governing criteria change, changes and then and then so we have we need a criterion in which uh, the peers is able to uh, account for this effect and uh, consider it in in uh, in the mechanism that is activated and the displacement capacity which is um, associated with the different mechanisms. Here you see another an example of a picture that uh, I took casually in uh, uh, after the Emilia 2012 event. You see these cracks in in this wall. But looking at these cracks, you can identify that some of them are associated with bending rocking. Uh, and you see this uh, there is an horizontal crack here, a diagonal crack here. And and this here uh, in this pier you can see when the inertial forces act from uh, left to right was corresponding to a shear failure. But the contrary happens in uh, uh, when the forces act in the other direction. And in electric loading, this always happens. And then you can see that there there are different high effective height, but also different failure modes depending on this. Um, on the, in the pushing direction. The other important aspect that uh, need to be uh, covered by your tool is the capability of analyzing floor uh, diaphragm considering their actual stiffness. And this is a relevant aspect because uh, this uh, in plane stiffness of the diaphragm governs the lateral um, spread of uh, forces and uh, sharing of forces of horizontal forces among walls in a in a pushover or in a dynamic analysis. Uh, the membrane model, uh, which is implemented in uh, in Tremuri, is governed by a few parameters, which can be uh, let's say obtained uh, automatically from uh, homogenization in the simple cases or can be um, user defined if we consider for instance uh, more refined models for uh, the in-plane stiffness of uh, uh, of timber uh, uh, diaphragms considering the, the effect of uh, the nail stiffness or you can use um, say codified approaches still analytical in the case of the uh, New Zealand uh, code, or say more, uh, say rough, but practical in the case of the um, US uh, codes. What you see in uh, this uh, plot instead is the uh, same application, which is a, a little false, but again, still applicable uh, in the case of vaults. Uh, in, in, you see that uh, different walls can be associated with an equivalent membrane with nonlinear characteristics. Uh, what is uh, still missing, we hope uh, we, we will be able to, um, to introduce in the future version, is also some uh, displacement or deformation capacity to be associated with this, uh, with this uh, kind of equivalent diaphragm. Because in the case of um, timber diaphragm, of course, we have a nonlinear behavior, but it is typically associated with the larger in-plane displacement. In the case of walls, we can have a fragility of these elements uh, when they are uh, subject to in-plane distortion. The other thing is that uh, in case of very flexible diaphragm, the model allows to uh, perform analysis of uh, single walls. And it is generally correct in the sense that uh, if uh, 
wall to diaphragm and wall to wall connections are effective, then we can assume that uh, out of plane uh, displacements are prevented. We saw it in, uh, in the video in uh, the beginning of this presentation. Uh, but still, we cannot uh, count on uh, any coupling effect of the flaws uh, in uh, um, transmitting forces from one, uh, one wall to the, uh, to the other. So we can uh, uh, work on uh, different, on this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, substructures, uh, uh, which are the in-plane uh, uh, analysis of walls. But when we do this, uh, we should also account to properly um, um, computation of tributary vertical loads and masses, uh, in particular inertial masses that uh, need to be um, properly evaluated uh, in the case of uh, in-plane uh, um, single wall analysis. Uh, the tie effect of flows, because uh, if flows are connected, they maybe are not um, providing uh, um, a sufficient shear stiffness, uh, which allows to couple the, uh, the, the displacement of the different walls, but uh, it can couple the displacement of the different nodes um, of the uh, of, of the consider wall at this uh, at, the, at the same uh, level and it should be also accounted for the tie uh, for the flange effect uh, of portion of the perpendicular walls uh, that can transform these um, measuring portion in uh, collaborating portions if the connection is uh, is suitable this is an application uh, to a building in, uh, in Basel, in which we try to consider the effect of different uh, interventions on, uh, on the in-plane stiffness of, uh, of floors using the Tremuri program. This is the, the building. Uh, as you can see, in my case study is not as well. Um, and the, uh, appealing as the, the ones that were presented by by the previous speakers, but uh, the idea is to compare the model with very flexible uh, diaphragms. So basically, uh, uh, the, the initial condition, then moderately flexible flows. Well, when we possibly we have some stiffening effect of uh, double layer meshwork planks uh, and pavements, then we have a an intermediate case of uh, stiffening diaphragms with, uh, uh, say, multi-layer spruce ply plywood panels, uh, so some timber-based uh, um, interventions, and these almost uh, infinitely rigid uh, uh, flaws uh, obtained by applying um, a collaborating RC slab uh, stiff enough, as uh, in some of the interventions presented in for instance, uh, those uh, about the, the Vienna buildings. What you see is that uh, model analysis is providing some uh, results in which uh, for very flexible diaphragms, we typically have uh, independent modes uh, for, the, um, for the different uh, walls, whereas for the rigid uh, diaphragms, we tend to have a, a, a global um, uh, response. And this is also clearly checked in uh, in the percentage of uh, participation participating masses which is uh, um, 46 percent in the flexible uh, diaphragm case and goes up almost to 90 percent in the rigid diaphragm case and these are the curves and the you can see that uh, there is a significant increase in terms of uh, um, lateral strength when we move from the flexible diaphragm to the uh, rigid one, or at least stiff ones, uh, which is a, a demonstration that in this case, we have a collaboration um, in between the different uh, walls, which is enforced by the presence of these stiff uh, elements. Uh, these are some uh, results uh, 
from nonlinear dynamic analysis, which were performed on the same uh, buildings. I will go uh, quickly on, on this. But what is interesting is that uh, in terms of uh, comparison between pushover and uh, nonlinear dynamic analysis uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of um, displacement shapes, then we see that uh, even in uh, in the case of uh, quite flexible diaphragms, in this case at least, uh, the approximation of the, the displacement and the, or the reflected shape is uh, quite good in um, in case of a pushover analysis performed on a on a large building uh, uh, like this instead of performing the analysis on the on the single walls uh, separately. The point is that uh, the not only the displacement shape but also the displacement demand is uh, say approximately well uh, captured but in some cases depending on the on the um, uh, load pattern adopted for the pushover analysis we have uh, uh, better or uh, worse uh, approximation and this, uh, say, leads to the last point of this uh, of this presentation, is which is related to the to the approximation we have in uh, uh, intrinsically in the use of uh, nonlinear pushover and nonlinear static analysis, which is the computation of the displacement demand. Uh, as we, I was uh, mentioning before, when we use a, a sim uh, simplification like this. We uh, we need to use um, either an overdamping uh, approach, which is the one embedded in the capacity spectrum method, uh, or we can use inelastic uh, spectra, which is uh, a spectral reduction accounting for the, the activity. This is a comparison uh, specific for the Dutch uh, code, which uh, allows the use of the capacity spectrum method. And you can see that uh, the conservatism of this code can be uh, clearly seen from, from this thick black line in which we see that the prediction is systematically, um, the, the, mean, the median prediction is systematically larger than the, uh, the one obtained from uh, nonlinear time history analysis which could be okay, apart from the fact that the scatter of these results is huge. So when we compare nonlinear static and nonlinear um, dynamic analysis, we can see that there is a, a significant uh, uh, scatter using this procedure. And this is uh, something that we can also um, observe, in particular the scatter issue, for the uh, improved formulation, which is pre presented, there is an error here. This is, the, this is not the NPR, this is the FEMA, uh, is the US uh, code uh, presenting the same, uh, say, theoretically the same approach with some improved coefficients, and in particular with an improved relation in between the spectral reduction factor and activity. So, in the end, we, there is a, this use of overdumped spectra. But in the end, the, this, over -damp this damping uh, is derived from the activity. And this is something that, uh, in the end, probably, um, say, uh, goes in the direction of using other formulations, which uh, directly make use of, um, of, uh, of the activity uh, for the reduction of uh, uh, the displacement so for the, for the increase of the displacement demand by correcting the, the ductility demand. And this is uh, the formulation which is provided in Eurocode 8, which derives from the, um, the FIFAR uh, proposal. And this is a more recent proposal that we have been working on uh, from, let's say, using Tremuri as a, say, a linear analysis tool for uh, analyzing a number of uh, um, uh, systems also characterized by um, 
short period structure, which is the typical condition of, of mesory buildings. And in this, in this case, we can see that uh, we can uh, uh, correct uh, this trend, which is again uh, conservative for the, for the lower displacement demand levels, but that becomes un unconservative in the higher uh, display, in the displacement and activity demand where it should be more. Uh, this is the result of the modified uh, N2 method. And in particular, this is uh, what happens uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, short period uh, structures. You can see that there is a, a, a black line which is not exactly aligned with the B sectors of this. Uh, um, the sector with this uh, diagram, which should be the, the ideal case, it is still uh, conservative, but not that scatter as is uh, in the in the previous case. And this is the comparison uh, again in the case of natural or induced seismicity, and you see that the results are basically the same, at least at, up to um, an activity level of four. Then. Uh, we can notice a small uh, deviation from the, the B sector. And this is this, the plot we have seen before. So I thank you for your kind attention. I hope uh, also this uh, final uh, presentation, which was not as nice as the previous one, but uh, I think uh, it has been uh, quite, uh, say, um, interesting to have something different uh, at the end.